February 21st, 2018. We're going to be covering uh, how to write up an offer using the residential purchase agreement in California. And more importantly, I'm going to be covering how to get the offer accepted. Okay, And this is important because the truth is I can teach you how to draft up contracts you know, multiple times. And at the end of the day, who, you can write 100 contracts, but if they're not accepted, who cares, right? So as opposed to me, as opposed to me starting with the contract stuff, which is gonna put you to sleep first, I'm gonna start with how to get your offer accepted first, and then we'll go into the contract portion at the end. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Sure. Good, yeah. okay, good. Because you guys are awake right now, so everyone's okay with it, okay? So let's talk about that. How to get your offer accepted. Number one, CEO mindset. This is very, very important. I say it all the time. You guys are the CEO of your own company, the CEO of your brand. Okay, so you control your business, and this is huge. I want to recognize David Lee really, really quick. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but he just signed up for coaching. Okay, he's doing it with, I'm not going to say the name of the organization because then I'm giving them free plugs, but he is a, a coaching student now. So he's paying monthly to be coached and hounded and mentored by another organization outside the company. And while we do have great coaching and training here, it doesn't hurt when you invest in, in, in yourself and get that coaching as well. So let's give him a real quick round of applause, guys. Okay, he just, he just signed himself up for that coaching. Um, so he is now a coaching client. Uh, CEO mindset, number one, you gotta understand that they are still the client, okay? They are the client, you are the expert, you need to act like it, all right? If you go and you're telling them and you're filling out a residential purchase agreement and you're having them sign it and you don't seem confident about what you're doing, you're not quite sure about what you're doing, you're saying, well, I'm not really sure about how we should fill this portion of the contract out. How do you think they're gonna feel, <laughs> yeah, you're right? Good. Not at all, right? So you have to be very, very confident. You have to understand that you are the expert in this transaction until you give them reason to doubt that you are not. Right? So when the client starts telling you what to do, guess what has happened? You, essentially what has happened is they no longer have confidence in your ability to represent them. Okay? And I'm not saying that they don't have, as the client, they don't have the right to ask questions or to ask certain things. But you have to assume the position of the expert. Okay? It's very, very important. It's like going into surgery and then at the doctor asking you what you think you should do. How would you feel? <laughs> right? No, not at all. You don't want that doctor performing surgery on you, okay? Likewise, you don't you're not going to want someone who is not assuming the authoritative position to represent you in what is potentially going to be the largest financial decision of your life. Okay? Very, very important. So number one, act like the expert. Number two, most people excuse me, uh, that's number four now. Most people are afraid to make a decision. Okay, you've got to understand that. People are always scared about making decisions, especially decisions that are this big and this important. Which means that nine times out of 10, you're going to have to walk them through that decision. You have to understand that. It's not unusual when you're talking to somebody about drafting up an offer for, for a home and they're not gonna be sure about it. They're gonna question it, they're gonna doubt it. And the truth is they're probably not going to, to not you know be so enthused and excited about moving forward because it's a big step, it's a big decision. You have to be able to walk them through that decision. It's very, very important, okay? Be prepared for that. Everyone hates to buy, but everybody loves to own, all right? What does that mean? That means they're not gonna be fans of the process. The process can be challenging, the process can be stressful, the pro process can be difficult, right? It is going to be, okay? So they're not gonna like the process, but the minute they become the owner of the home, right? They're gonna love it. Okay, they're gonna love you for it, all right? So understand that it's okay. You're gonna go through some challenges during the, this, this process, but it, it's gonna take somebody like you to navigate them through this, okay? The process will be challenging. You have to be their lighthouse, okay? And lastly, use technology to your advantage now. Now that we have, you know, DocuSign, now that we can do things by email, now that we can do all of that stuff, Make sure that you use technology to their advantage, okay? Now, I know that there are going to be some people in some communities that are going to say, well, you know, I have certain clients that they don't want to use, uh, they don't want to use DocuSign, okay? Well, here's the thing. They don't want to use DocuSign, but I see, I see my abuelita using Snapchat. So if my abuelita can still use Snapchat, trust me, she can use DocuSign, okay? You're just not coaching her right, okay? That's what's going on. What's going on is you're letting them get away, again, 
with, you, with, with saying, oh, I don't really like technology, I don't know how to use technology, and yet they're using all this social media stuff. They're doing it anyway, mind you, okay? So I don't want to hear this about my community doesn't use technology. That's not true. They use it. They use it to share all the videos and the memes. Trust me, I see it all the time, okay? So use technology to your advantage. Trust me, it's easier. It's going to save your, it's going to make your life a lot easier, okay? All right, next slide. Okay, tools. What are the tools that you're going to need? Well, if you're going to draft up an offer, number one, you're going to need to be a member. You're going to need to be a realtor member. Okay? You're going to be, need to be a member of the board because without those things, you're not going to have access to the forms that you use. Okay, so you need your realtor NRDS number. You're going to need access to zip forms. Okay, you need that stuff. You're going to need access to the MLS. All right. So these are all things that are, that are required. These are tools that you're going to have to have, you guys. You can't escape this. You, you're probably going to need access to a title report. And the reason you're going to want a title report is it's going to show you the exact name of the people on title. It's going to tell you if it's a trust. It's going to tell you if it's a husband and wife. It's going to tell you all these things. And so it's better to find out who's on title when you're submitting the report. You're going to use uh, DocuSign. You're going to use digital ink. Now, more and more uh, digital signature companies are coming up, right? Adobe has one. I, I received one from a company called Right Signature recently. There's a few other ones. But the ones that I use, the one that I use the most, it happens to be DocuSign. Um, and, and I know a lot of people that use digital ink, but you're gonna want to get used to using electronic di di digital signature companies, okay? Get used to it. Next thing uh, we use in the company, we use something called Transaction Room, which we're, we're gonna start enforcing a lot more. All offers that are going to be submitted are subject to review by management, okay? That's not just in this office, that's in any office. And Transaction Room provides you a, a hub where you can upload all the offers to where the offers can then be reviewed and approved by management that way as well. Okay, this is all for compliance. So these are the tools that you're gonna need, okay? Transaction room in our company doesn't cost the agents any money. Every agent that's a member of this company gets their own ID and password to get in the transaction. Di DocuSign and Digital Inc. Digital Inc. is free with your MLS membership and your access to that, so that's free. DocuSign will cost you extra, that's, that's an expense on your own, but all the other stuff is standard stuff that you should already have, okay? So these are the tools that you're gonna need, okay? Next slide. What I expect. This is very, very important, okay? When you're working with the client, you need to set the expectations, set the tone for what you will expect from them, okay? See, the, the reality is most of us, when we're working with a client, when we're working with a buyer, what happens is, is that they set their expectations on us, okay? But you have expectations as a professional too, yes or no? Right, so you need to set the tone, set the stage, set the speed for how this process is going to work and what's gonna happen during this process. Number one, Mr. or, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, any listings that you're interested in, any listings that you see as you're driving around town, any listings that you see on the internet, I want you to bring those to me. I'll do the investigating for you. I'll do the due diligence for you, okay? You don't need to call the other agent. You don't need to research any agent, anything else. I'm the agent, I'll do that research for you. How does that sound? Sounds great, right? Now, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if we do come to the conclusion that some of these homes are going to be homes that you're going to be interested in, I want you to go visit those homes sometime during the week prior to me taking you out there. I want you to visit them. I don't need to be with you. You can go on your own. You can go when you're coming home from work. I want you to find out if this is the type of neighborhood that you want to live in, and then you come back to me and let me know. And if it is, then I'll get you inside the home. Now, why am I having you do that? Yeah, exactly, right? Because here's, here's the thing. There have been times in my career where I will drive someone, and I've had a client that will say to me, I want to see this house, I want to see this house, I want to see this house, I want to see this house. They're excited about seeing the house. We're in the car. I want to see that house. I'm excited about seeing the house. That's the house I want to see. I'm confident. That's the house I want to buy. I want to buy that house. I like that house. That's the one that I saw on the internet. I want to buy the house. The minute we start driving through the neighborhood, I don't want the house. I don't want this house. I don't, I don't like this neighborhood. I don't like where you're taking me. Yeah. There's a liquor store around the corner. See, yeah. I and, and let me tell you, you think that, that I'm the only one that this has happened to. This happens to everybody, okay? And it isn't until it's happened to you 30, 40, 50 times that you finally decide to yourself, I'm not conducting my business this way, right? So I'm gonna save you guys the headaches, the gas expense, okay? The running to McDonald's to go pee. I'm gonna save you all of that, that, that stress by telling you right now, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this is what I expect from you. I expect that you're gonna bring me any listing that you're interested in. 
through me so that I can do the research for you. I'm going to save you some time. I'm going to save you some money. I'm going to find out what's really happening. I'm going to see if they have the offers. I'm going to see how much negotiation pull I have. I'm going to do that for you because I'm your agent. In addition to that, here's what I expect from you. I want you to go visit that property on your own. Drive around the neighborhood, tell me if it is something that you're interested in, something that you want to get inside so that I can get you inside there on Saturday. Or would Sunday be better for you? And by the way, are mornings better or afternoons? Which would you prefer? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's how I want you to conduct the business. Oh, and by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, what I want you to do is I want you to get pre-approved by our lender so that that way we can find out exactly, you know, how, how much your buying power really is. Okay? Now, what did I just say? I didn't say to see what you can afford, okay? to see what, how, how strong and how much your buying power is. That's different. Doesn't power sound better than how much you can afford? Okay, language guys, language. I want you, I want to know just how much your buying power is. I need you to call my friend. <laughs> it's all language as opposed to, I need to know, see how much you can afford before I work with you. How, which one sounds better? Buying power. buying power, right? We can all agree on that. Now, the next thing you're going to want is Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'm going, to, I'm going to need to see some type of proof of funds. That's something I'm going to need to see. Now, mind you, it, it depends on where you're at with the process because if you're dealing with an internet buyer, a buyer that doesn't know you from Adam and is calling you for one of your listings or is calling you for another property that you might not represent, chances are you start coming off that strong with that type of lead that you have no relationship with, you're going to have a difficult time getting that information just so you know. They're going to say uh, goodbye. Okay, they're probably, I was going to say something else, but they're probably not going to uh, provide you with any of that. So you have to build rapport, you have to build a relationship with them, okay? Uh, but again, this is assuming I'm sitting down in front of them and I'm telling them what my expectations are. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if you're going to buy it, I need to know what kind of investing you're going to get it in. I need to know if you're going to buy it as an individual. I need to know if we're going to get it as a corporation. I also need to know if we're going to get it as a trust. If we are going to get it as a corporation or as a trust, I'm going to need to see all the documentation that pertains to that trust. Show me that you are an authorized signer on behalf of that corporation or on behalf of that trust. How soon can you get it for me? Do you think you can get it for me by Thursday or do you think Saturday would be better? What did I just do? Alternative choice close, assume to close, and I'm waiting for them to send me that information and I give them two options to send it to me. Would you prefer to email it to me or would you prefer, prefer to fax it, even though I'm hoping Gosh, they want some facts, right? Okay, understand the market. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, in addition to that, I'm going to understand, I'm gonna help you understand the market. I'm gonna tell you what's going on with the market, the market conditions. I'm gonna tell you if a property is priced under the market so that they, that they can get overbid, or if a property is priced too aggressive for the market, just to see what our, what our buying power really is. I'm gonna study that stuff for you, I'm gonna know that stuff for you. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, it may take more than one offer to get your offer accepted. I don't want you thinking, has it happened? Yes, but I don't want you thinking that we're going to submit one offer and it's automatically going to be accepted. Especially, in, for instance, in our market right now, it is what kind of a market? A buyer's market or a seller's market? It's a seller's. So chances are that in this market, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be a little challenging. I don't want you to get discouraged if your offer doesn't get accepted on the first try. Okay? So set the stage. See, if you have these conversations early with your client at the beginning, Later on when it happens, they're going to remember that you guys talked about this. As opposed to this coming up later on when an offer is submitted and an offer is not accepted and they really wanted that home and then they're frustrated and you are the villain. Does everybody understand that, right? Set the stage, okay? Understand that it might take more than one offer. Don't get discouraged. Explain, oh, also explain the inspection process while you're, while you're talking to your client. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. If our offer is accepted, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna have an inspection period. We're gonna be able to go and we're gonna be able to kick the tires, okay? You're gonna have to pay for a home inspector. Prepare them for the cost. Home inspector's probably gonna cost you about $500. I'm gonna recommend that you get a sewer inspection. Sewer inspection's gonna probably be about $400. I'm gonna recommend that you get a roof inspection. Roof inspection might be about $250. I'm gonna recommend that you get a chimney inspection. A chimney inspection is also gonna be around $300, okay? These are all expenses that they're going to have to incur. You might as well prepare them for it as opposed to telling them, you know, later on in the game. Okay, I'm telling you it's harder later on. Okay, prepare them early. Start telling them they're gonna have to pay for all these inspections. Prepare them that when the inspection takes place, they will have the opportunity to then do what is called a request for repairs or to do a credit back. Let them know that early. Okay, <coughs> then you wanna explain the deposit. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. When our offer is accepted, you're going to have to deposit 
you know, usually it can be up to 3% of what the purchase price is. So if the purchase price is $700,000 home, you're going to be talking about a $21,000 deposit potentially. You're going to have to deposit that within three days. Not three business days, three days of it, the acceptance, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. So that means that if we get accepted on a Friday, you've got Saturday, Sunday, you've got till Monday to make that deposit or you are in breach of contract. Prepare them early, right? Explain what your expectations are. Explain the TC fee, okay? In our organization, in our firm, we have a TC fee, which is a transaction coordinator fee. This is not unheard of, it is not unusual. Many other companies have this fee, okay? This is a fee that is used to pay for the transaction coordinator that monitors a transaction, all right? In our company, for Real Estate Heaven, it's $350. I've seen some companies that charge as high as $750. I've seen them, all right? Prepare your client. Look, I'm not gonna collect any money from you right now. That money is collected at when we get ready to close the escrow. So don't think that you're gonna pay me or you're gonna give me any money, but I want you to know that there is a transaction coordinator fee. It is gonna be one of those fees that is processed at the end by the escrow, okay? So prepare them early, all right? Prepare them that you're gonna ask for referrals. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, once I get you into your home, and once you're thrilled with my quality of service, I hope I can count on you for referrals down the road, right? I'm never too busy for your referrals. Right? I'm still one from Brian mm -hmm. All right, prepare them early, right? Trying to do everything at the end doesn't work. If you start setting your expectations now, trust me, it helps. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, when we're done with this process and I got you in your home and you guys are thrilled and you're ecstatic, I'm gonna need for you to give me an online review. I don't want it to be a lie, I don't want it to be an exaggeration, just an honest review of my quality of service. Can I count on you to do that for me? Okay? Now I gotta tell you, you guys, a lot of us are missing this. And we're not talking about this. We're not talking about the TC fee early enough, and we're not talking about the online review early enough. Start preparing your clients for what your expectations are. Right? Okay? Now, what can what can you expect? This is important. Because if I have expectations, I'm certain that you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you guys have expectations too, yes or no? Right? They're going to have expectations. So here's what you can expect. Number one, you have access to me. You can call me. You can um, text me. You can email me. If you want to connect with me on social media, feel right ahead. I'm going to be there for you. You're going to have access to me when you need me. Okay? In fact, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, it isn't unheard of for me when I'm working with a client or we're about to get into escrow for me to talk to a buyer uh, every single day until the process is over. I mean, think about it, you guys. When you guys are on escrow with somebody, how often is it that you just communicate with the client? Like almost every There are times when I'll communicate with them more during the day than I will my own wife. Okay? It's not something I'm proud of, but it's just that's just what happens. Okay? So you're gonna have access to me. Here's what you can expect. You can expect brutal honesty. So Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Sometimes you're not gonna wanna hear it. Okay? I'm gonna tell you that you're gonna need to offer more. I'm going to tell you that you're going to have to kill this deal. I'm going to tell you that you didn't qualify for that offer or that offer was rejected. I'm going to, there are going to be some moments where I may give you some bad news, okay? But at least you can expect honesty from me, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. And I hope you can appreciate that, okay? Uh, reconnaissance of the property. Okay, I'm going to research the property for you. I'm going to find out if that property can be financed. There are some properties that you're going to find and you're going to bring to me and I'm going to research and I'm going to find out that it can't be financed because of its condition, because it's so it's, it's in such a dilapidated condition it can't be financed. I'm going to find out that court confirmation is going to be required. This might be a probate. And even if I get your offer accepted, we're still going to have to go to court to, 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 to get court confirmation. I'm going to find out that there might be pending litigation on the building and because of pending litigation, I can't sell you that condo that you wanted in downtown. These are all things that I'm going to find out and discover as I go through the reconnaissance and you can expect that from me, okay? You can also expect weekly updates, okay? Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, every Friday, I'm going to call you and I'm going to give you an update. And it may, it's, you're going to hear from me and you're going to hear about the transaction and what's going on or you're going to hear about new properties or we're going to hear about our offers, but you're going to hear from me every Friday. You can expect it. I'm going to call you and give you updates, all right? And you can expect my dedication to you and your family and getting you in that house, okay? Let me ask you guys a question. If you talk to your client, okay, you sit down with them and you lay out your expectations and you lay out what, what they should expect from you, how does that sound? What, what does that do to you as a professional? 
you look professional, okay? As opposed to, okay, so hop in my car, I'll see you Saturday at Starbucks, we'll hop in, we'll go look at a few houses, and then afterwards we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> right? Doesn't work that way. Right? It's, it's like a doctor saying to a patient, hey, thanks for coming in, great, I saw you, uh, Saturday we'll have a surgery at three. I don't even know what's wrong with you, but we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> You guys get that, right? Mm -hmm. This is what's going to set you apart. You need to start laying the groundwork for what your expectations are for the client and what they can expect from you. Okay? All right. Next, getting accepted. Number one, don't be shy about your client wanting the house. Okay? This is big. Okay? A lot of times, buyers want to come in. You know, we can't show our excitement. We don't want them to know how bad we really want. But look, that's a, that doesn't work. That doesn't. This isn't poker. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Because at the end of the day, the seller wants to get the house sold. Period. Okay? They want to work with someone that does want the house because they want the transaction to close. Yeah. Okay? Don't let your clients go in there, oh no, we can't tell them how much we really No, no, no. Look, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I just want you to know, if you want this house, I'm going to tell them, look, we want it. We're here to negotiate. We're here to fight. Let's make a deal. Let's figure something out so that both parties can be happy, so that the sellers can be happy and the buyers can be happy. This is how it's going to play out. Okay? But going in there and acting like you don't want the house and you don't really care for it, look, it, you know, it doesn't do anything to help your, your case, okay? especially not when it's a seller's market and they've got multiple offers. they got multiple offers. You tell them, look, I want this house for my family and for my kids. We need to be in this school district. We've already submitted seven other offers. None of them got accepted. I want this house. What do I got to do? How does that sound to a seller? Right? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more later on. You're going to need a cover letter. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'm going to need a cover letter from you with your bio. I want to know a little bit about you. I want to know a little bit about your kids. I want to know a little bit about your pets. I want to know a little bit about your goldfish. I want to know a little bit about all this so that I can create a cover letter for you and a picture of you and the goldfish so that I can include it in the bio and send it to the other agent. Okay? All right. Prepare them. You might have to offer more than what the list price is, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. Okay? This is just the reality of today's market. And some sellers are pricing their home under market so that they can get over there. Don't think that just because someone priced it below market, you're going to be able to get it at that price. Okay? Sorry. I said I was going to be honest with you, didn't I? Okay? Now, don't be offended by a counter. This is another thing. Prepare them early. Okay? There are some people that negotiate very different. Okay? Sometimes you're going to get someone that they're going to submit an offer and then they're going to get a counter for dang near list full price. Okay? And it won't make sense because it's been on the market for 150 days. <laughs> right? I don't get it either. That doesn't matter. Prepare them for that possibility. Don't be offended by a counter. You might get a counter that on paper doesn't seem to make sense at all. Don't let that knock you off the park. If you want this home, let's figure out a way to make it work. Let's counter them again and let's negotiate some more. Okay? Do the dance. You want this home, right, Mr. and Mrs. Fire? Good. Then we need to counter again. I don't want to hear this, oh, I got offended. How could they think about countering it? No, look, let's counter them again. Let's see what we can get. Okay? But again, Again, if you're not talking to the client that way, they're gonna control the entire situation and you're not gonna be able to get them back in the game. All right? Uh, get a hold of the listing agent. So when I have an offer and I'm getting ready to submit the offer, okay, it is not uncommon for me to call the listing agent okay, and submit my offer. It's not uncommon for me to shoot them the offer through Facebook. It's not uncommon for me to shoot them the offer through LinkedIn. I'm gonna send them through email, through Facebook, through LinkedIn, I'm going to upload it to Google Docs, I'm going to get a link and I'm going to share that link with them through their text, I'm going to share them that link through Twitter, whatever it takes, I'm going to get a hold of that agent and I'm going to make sure that that agent knows my client wants his house, we're here to play. Now if you do that with an agent and the agent sees that you've submitted you know, the offer seven different times through seven different platforms, what, is that, what, what, what kind of an impression does that make on that agent? Right? Or they think you're really crazy. <laughs> but then at least they'll remember you. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Trust me, I do this. Okay? This is what I do. On top of that, I'll also shoot them a bomb bomb video. Okay, so I'll do a real quick bomb bomb video. Hey John or Jane, listen, just want to let you know my clients decided they're gonna submit an offer on that property. Look, they're really, really excited about this home. They want this home, John. I want to do whatever I have to do to get them this home. I hope that you get this message. Please confirm that you did and confirm that you got my offer. Thanks, Paul Bye. Done, send a message. 
right? Trust me, you stand out. Then what I do is I have the lender reach out to the listing agent, and I have the lender call the listing agent, and the lender say, hey, John or Jane, just want to let you know my clients, the buyers, who are being represented by Paul, just submitted an offer on your listing. I want to make sure that you got their list, their offer. Oh, and I want you to know that I am doing the loan. They're fully pre-approved. We can do this loan. They want this house. I want to do whatever we can do to help them get it. Get it. So what did that have, what did that do now? That now you've got me sending all this information. You've got the lender telling them they want it, right? Doesn't that impress upon the listing agent who then has to impress upon the seller that these are the clients that we should be going with? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Okay? Oh, it's never accepted until it's signed. Right? Big. Okay, this is big. You have to make sure that the buyer understands. Right? In fact, it's probably not a good thing to tell your client that an offer has ever been accepted until you receive the executed contract back. Ever. Ever. I've had times where other agents have sent me an offer and they're like, yeah, you're, we're going to go with your offer, we're going to accept it. Later on, I find out it's an escrow with another client and all I had was a verbal confirmation. Okay? Trust me. Have you guys seen Jerry Maguire? If not, you need to watch Jerry Maguire. Okay? It's not shake my hand. It's sign the contract. Okay? That's what we need. It's never accepted until it's signed. Don't tell your client it's the, it, that they're, they're an escrow until you get a signed uh, <coughs> a signed uh, contract. Fair enough? Let me get some water real quick. Sorry, guys. Any questions so far? Uh, what about contingencies? Okay, good. We're going to go into contingencies right now. That's a good question. All right, now we're gonna go into the nitty gritty. So mainly what I've done up until this point is I just helped you guys with your posture, all right, with your confidence. I'm just trying to make you a little bit more confident about what you're doing when you're submitting, when you're prepping and submitting the offer. Now we're gonna talk about the forms. Forms are a little different, all right? So I'm gonna go through these forms and we're gonna talk about it. So you guys, it, I know that it's a little small on the screen, but chances are you've probably have already seen what these forms look like. The first one is, uh, is called, and I'm going in the order that, that wind forms or zip forms put them in when you're, when you're filling out these forms. So the first one that you're gonna see is called the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship, okay? So the buyer's gonna sign that, and you're gonna sign that as their agent. Now, if you have the type of client that wants you to explain everything to them, I'm gonna treat you guys like you're my buyer, and we're gonna go through the forms, and I'm gonna have you sign them right now, how does that sound? Okay, all right, so Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, the first form that we're, we're looking at is a form called the Disclosure Regarding Real Estate Agency Relationship. All this form basically says is that you are the buyer, and I am the agent, and that I am representing you. Now the second page is a bunch of, it's a bunch of civil codes, okay? I don't know all of these civil codes. In fact, I'm gonna give you a copy, so that way tonight you can have a warm glass of milk, and you can review all the civil codes yourself, and that way you know what it is that we're talking about, okay? These civil codes can change, but you know, they're created by the California Association of Realty. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah most people don't, they, you know, yeah. who reads civil codes, right? Okay, so usually they don't have a problem with that. They sign it. Next page is the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. Look, just so you guys know, I don't read these forms to them. Possible representation of more than one buyer or seller basically says that at any given moment, as an agent, I will have more than one client, okay? I mean, this is common knowledge, you already know that, but I need to make sure that you acknowledge that in writing, okay? And all it says is that you're my client and I could have three or four other clients. It also says that at any given moment, I might be representing the seller or I might be representing the buyer. In this case, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'm only representing you, the buyer, okay? I need you to sign right here. Next slide, next uh, form, the wire fraud and electronic transfer advisor. All this says, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, is that uh, you, you need to be take precautionary measures anytime that you are wiring funds, okay? Because there's been a lot of fraud that's been going on with wire transfers, and so we need to make sure um, that you confirm every wire transfer that you make to the escrow company or to the lender or to anyone, okay? And that's all this form basically says. Are you okay with that form? Yeah. Okay, next slide. Now let's talk about the actual purchase agreement, okay? 
So, first thing that you're gonna need to know, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, again, we talked about this, you're gonna be purchasing this in your own individual names. Okay, so we're gonna put your name or names there. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you said you were gonna purchase it in the form of a trust, and if that you are gonna purchase it as a trust, that's fine, I'm gonna need copies of the trust, okay? And then I need proof that you are an authorized signer. In that case, you're, there's another form that you're gonna need, okay? And we'll, we'll, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but I'll go into it a little bit later on in another training, all right? So the name of the buyer, for now, let's just assume it's in the individuals. John Doe wants to purchase the property, and then you have the property address. You need the APN number, which is why earlier I said you wanna have a property profile so that you can have the APN number. Do you guys know what APN stands for? Assessor's parcel number, right? The tax ID number, okay? Then you're gonna put the purchase price, right? You're gonna put the close of escrow date on there. Now you can use an actual date or you can say 45 days after escrow, depends on you. Normally my position is I will put 45 days after escrow, okay? Now in some cases um, you can put an actual date because for whatever reason they need to close on a specific date for tax purposes or for moving purposes, whatever it might be, all right? In this case, we are only representing the sell, the buyer, so we are what is called the selling agent on the form. Okay, so we're going to put REH, Real Estate, or Real Estate Heaven International, same thing. Okay, then what we're going to do is you're going to put the initial deposit. A good deposit is typically 3%. Okay, 3% is a good deposit. Now, some people are going to have qualms with that, right? Because what if they're buying um, a, uh, I don't know, a $10 million property, right? That's a lot of money, okay? So, you know, you, you can gauge it, right? But a good deposit should be something substantial enough to where the buyer is showing the seller that they're serious about playing ball, okay? Uh, you know, somebody putting a $1,000 deposit, you know, doesn't have much skin in the game, right? Okay, so make sure the deposit is good. Next thing you're gonna wanna do is, uh, if you're gonna increase the deposit some way throughout the transaction, then you're gonna put that on, on line 3B, but we're not gonna talk about that right now because most people I've noticed aren't doing that these days. Most people are just putting a deposit and then they're financing the rest, okay? And they're coming in with the remainder of their down payment when it's time to close. That's typically how most transactions are these days, right? So first loan, first loan is, is really the loan that they're gonna be taking out. So depending on what they're doing, if they're gonna do a 3.5% down or if they're gonna do a 20% down, you're gonna put the loan amount on line 3B, okay? Whatever that loan amount is going to be. Then the balance is gonna show up here for a total purchase price at the bottom, okay? Now, if you're using wind forms or zip forms, this stuff, based on what you put for the initial deposit and the loan, okay? Line 3A and line 3D, whatever you put in those two spots will then auto-populate on the bottom, all right? Now, what you should do is, you should log in and you should mess with this a little bit and just play around with it. Because I gotta tell you that it's very embarrassing to be doing this in front of a client and then trying to figure it out right then and there. Okay, which by the way I've done. Okay, every mistake that I'm sharing with you, I've already done. And smart old me didn't learn after two, three, four times. Many times it took me like five or six times before I finally decided I'm not gonna do it this way. Alright? So, anyway, that's the first page of the RPA. Second page, right? Second page is gonna talk about the verification of down payment and closing costs, right? So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, what I'm going to need from you is I'm going to need some type of proof of funds, okay? Typically can be a bank statement that shows that you have the down payment there, liquid funds. It Maybe it's not a bank statement, maybe it's stocks and bonds, maybe it's a 401k. Whatever it might be, I need a copy of that so that I can show the, the listing agent that we have the proof of funds available. When you are submitting proof of funds, please make sure that you block out or black out the address to your client's you know, uh, mailing uh, address and block out their account number, all right? Block it out, black it out. You, cannot, you don't want to be sending that information to anybody else, okay? Protect your client's interest. Next thing is the appraisal contingency and the removal, okay? So this is important because if there is an appraisal contingency, that means that the property has to appraise the value. So if your client wants to buy a home for 700,000, right? But then they want the home so much, they said, you know what, we're willing to offer 750000 And then they say that it's not contingent upon an appraisal. What they're basically telling the other agent and the, the seller is, they're going to come in with the difference. Okay? So you only check off line three, uh, that would be three I, if there is no appraisal contingency. So if you have a client that understands that they are going to have to come in with the difference. If it doesn't appraise the value, then you mark that off. Or if it's an all cash offer, right? Because if it's an all cash offer, then there is no appraisal and it doesn't make any difference. 
Now, if you're dealing with a buyer that says, oh, it's an all cash offer, but it is, there's still an appraisal contingency, guess what you've just discovered? That it's not really all cash, that it's probably hard money. There are a lot of investors that like to go out there and say they're purchasing all cash, but they're really getting hard money, and that's what, that's the only reason that they would leave an appraisal contingency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? So they try to sneak that in there. Okay? They'll tell you, oh no, it's all cash. Because in their minds, whether they get cash or hard money, the seller gets their money at the end of the day, they don't really care. So they're justifying that by saying it's all cash. When in reality, it's still subject to an appraisal. Okay? So that's not true. All right, next thing. Uh, item 3J2, loan contingency, okay? You have to explain to the buyer. Now, I'm gonna sum it, summarize this really, really quick so that everybody understands the process because you don't want an essay. You're not gonna have to go through every line on this, okay? You may have some clients that will wanna read it and that's fine. But if you just explain it to them, most clients are, are, are okay with this, okay? So here's the process. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna submit this offer. Within seven days, we're going to have to complete our inspection. Unless you change that, the contract specifically states within seven days. So a buyer can do their inspection within seven days. Okay? That means we're going to have to hire a home inspector, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. I prepared you at the very beginning that we're going to hire a home inspector, a roof inspector, a chimney inspector, and a sewer inspector. So just be ready. You're going to incur that expense. That's part of, part of buying it. And, and when we do that, you have seven days to review it. And to then decide if you're going to move forward with the transaction or if you're going to ask for repairs, or if you're going to ask for a credit back, and then you can do repairs on your own, okay? So that's what's going to happen. Then, within 10 days, right, within 10 days of that, um, the seller has to give you all of their disclosures, okay? So the seller has to give you every, uh, 10 days of, of acceptance, by the way, okay? So the seller has to give you all the disclosures that they have on the property, unless you modify the dates here. We're not going to go into that right now. That's, I think that's too much. But seller has to give you all the disclosures, you have the opportunity to review those disclosures, right? And then, again, either continue with the transaction, ask for repairs, or request a credit back. It's entirely up to you, all right? Within 17 days, you have to have uh, the appraisal contingency removed, okay? Which means that the buyer has to have done their appraisal. And then here in the contract, now it says 21 days, right? They've adjusted it now, because before it used to be 17. So within 21 days, the loan contingency needs to be removed, okay? So you were asking about the contingencies, right? Okay, so here's what I tell everybody. What I tell everybody that I work with, all of my clients, okay? I still use the old numbers. I still use 17, right? I know that the contracts reflect 21 days. But what I tell my clients is within 17 days, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, we have to A, get our inspection done, we have to get our appraisal done, and then we have to get our loan done, okay? After those 17 days or 21 days, if you wanna go by the contract, now, I'd rather under-promise and over-deliver, personally, so I, I still stick to 17 days. But within those that time frame, within that time frame, the buyer needs to get everything that they need to do done, okay? Once they do, they then, in writing, remove their contingencies, right, as evidence that they're ready to move forward with the transaction, but if they do that, then their, their deposit then becomes non-refundable. Okay, does everybody understand that? Okay, all right. So, that's that part. Okay. Then it talks about other addenda that you're going to include, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Then there's other terms. Okay, other terms is where you can add additional terms to the contract. Okay? This is where you know you can you could theoretically include termite repairs. Okay, so you could include seller to pay for a section one termite, seller to include uh, solar panels, right? Uh, seller to include warranty on the solar panels, right? Some of that stuff doesn't uh, doesn't appear there. So this is where you can add additional comments. All right. Allocation of costs, so we're going to talk about this, all right? We just talked about the um, nat uh, the home warranty, but we're going to talk about the ha the natural hazard disclosure, all right? So, um, I'm not going to really go into vendors right now, okay? Only because, again, this is I'm using this as a training video, and I'm not going to use our training videos as an opportunity to endorse other companies, all right? But I will tell you that later on you can come talk to me, and I'll tell you who our preferred vendors are and who we use. But this is where you would put the natural hazard uh zone disclosure report okay so you put that there and you typically pick your companies now understand though that you can pick your companies and a lot of times the listing agent is going to counter these, these items out okay I just want you guys to be prepared for that so what I've seen a lot of people do is when they really want the house for their client uh, they, they put sellers choice they just let the seller choice. okay all right next slide 
government requires and retrofits, those are typically seller uh, repairs, okay? And all that says, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, is that the seller is going to do everything that is required to have the home, uh, you know, meet the government re requirements for retrofit, okay? So low flow toilets, water heater strapping, earthquake gas shutoff valve, all these things are normal expenses that a seller is going to incur. So you check off seller. If it's a house that cannot be financed, if it's an all cash transaction, the truth is, if I'm the listing agent, I'm gonna say that the buyer's gonna pay for all that. I'm not gonna put that the seller's gonna pay, because at the end of the day, the buyer's gonna remodel this house and make repairs to the house anyway. So it just depends on the situation, but if it's a finance transaction, typically you're gonna put seller, seller transaction, okay? Escrow and title. So for escrow, I am gonna say that I'm going to suggest that you use real estate have an escrow, okay? especially if you're the listing agent, all right? And you're gonna recommend that Jocelyn and Sylvia be the escrow officers, okay? Put that in there, and okay, we'll talk a little bit more later on. Then you would also put the title company. Seller usually pays the uh, city and county transfer tax fee. Seller pays that, those are normal seller expenses, okay? Um, if there's an HOA, seller typically pays the HOA transfer uh, and document fee. Okay, those are normal seller expenses, so you're gonna mark that off here. Again, that the only time that changes is if it's an all cash transaction tax. Okay, all right. Uh, home warranty, okay? So you're gonna pick the home warranty company that you're gonna use. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Items included in set. So we're on page three of 10, this is important. Because if the buyer wants all the appliances, okay, this is where you're gonna you're gonna mention all of the all stoves, all refrigerators, all washers, and then you can put except or you can put additional items. I just had a client that just purchased a home, and the solar panels were not leased; they were included in the sale. Okay, so you have to put that down. They oh, there were some TVs and a Bose sound system that was also included in the sale. But you got to make sure that you put these items in there. If the client and the buyer wants those things, address it early, put it in the offer. Because trying to get those things later on, at the, after the close of escrow, is it's going to be very, very challenging. Okay, it's going to be very, very challenging. Um, I've had situations where there were professional drapes installed on a property, right? Really, really nice drapes. And at the close of escrow, the seller took them, right? Ooh. My buyers wanted them, okay? That turns really ugly really, really fast, all right? So include them, put those things on there. If the buyer says, I want these items, make sure that you put them, and this is page, uh, page three of 10, all right? Closing in possession, okay, good. Let's talk about that, that is important, okay? If you are representing the buyer, okay, you're going to put closing, if the buyer intends or doesn't intend, then you're gonna mark that off, buyer doesn't intend. Okay? Most clients are going to, to live in the property, most. Most of your transactions are going to be that way. But if they're not gonna live in that, if they're not gonna live there, you mark it off. And then what you're gonna say is you're also gonna put the date that they're gonna deliver the, the property vacant to them. Okay? This is very, very important, all right? Because I've had some transactions where, you know, the buyer's ready to move in, it's Friday, 5 p.m., they think they're gonna have the weekend to move in, and the seller says, no, you know, we countered close of escrow plus one, close of escrow plus three. And what that basically means is that you can, as a selling, as a listing agent, you can counter the seller uh, is going to live here at close of escrow plus number, how many number of days. So you can put two, you can put three, you can put one, whatever you want. And so if you're not careful and you're not reviewing all of the counters and all of the dates, which again, I've made this mistake, you could actually have a very, very upset client because they think they're gonna be able to move in or have the weekend to move in and they're not, okay? So you gotta make sure you monitor that. Now, if there's a tenant, you're also gonna have to address that as well, okay? That you're gonna have to put in additional terms, right? We talked about that on the other page. In the additional terms, you can put something like property to be delivered vacant at close of escrow, okay? In fact, if there is a tenant, uh, anytime there's a tenant involved, okay, my recommendation is always request that the property be delivered vacant at the close of escrow when there's a tenant, okay? Because you don't want for your buyer to buy a home and the tenant is still living. Especially in rent control. Especially in rent control areas. It's really, really bad. It's really, really bad. But you can tell because if two days into escrow, you walk into the house and the tenant's still living there and all the furniture's there, you, you basically say, we're not closing escrow. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna close. <laughs> All right. Uh, these are also dis these are disclosures, uh, lead-based paint, cancellation rights. Um, this is a lot of legal uh, language. Okay. 
And again, some of your clients are gonna wanna review this, and some of them are just gonna trust your, your, your guidance, okay? And what I normally say to them is, look, you can review all this, but this basically says that the seller has the, the, the obligation to disclose everything that they know about the property, the good, the bad, the ugly, period. And it's our job to review all that stuff on our own time, according to the dates on the contract, and make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. All right? Yeah. Next slide, where are we at? Okay, condition of the property, buyer's investigation of the property, title investing. Okay, this all repeats a lot of the stuff that I've already talked about, okay? Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, again, I'm assuming you're a client and I'm talking to you about the purchase agreement. Okay, buyer's investigation of the property. Remember, I said you're gonna have seven days, well, well, depending on the contract, because we can negotiate on uh, inspection continues to be removed within three days if we wanted, but we agreed that we knew we were gonna have to go do our inspection. My recommendation to you guys as buyer's agents is to complete an inspection of the property within 48 hours, mm -hmm. okay? So the minute you get an offer accepted, tell your client, we need to go find a home inspector, we gotta go do a home inspection within 48 hours. Do it immediately, get it out of the way, okay? That means you're also gonna have to call a few home inspectors to schedule them all at the same time, okay? So you would call the termite, you would call the sewer, you would call the chimney, you would call the home inspector, you would call them all, and you would schedule them all to be there. In some cases, you will spend three to four hours there. Yesterday, Chen was spending, he spent five hours at a home inspection, okay? Yeah. Well, what's up with the sewer inspection? I've never done in my life in 35 years. What's up with that? Yeah, so the reason wow. that I'm suggesting that is because we've had a few transactions, more Tell than me. a few now where you know the piping from the home to the sewer it was cracked the roots were undermining it and you know it was a twenty thousand dollar fix and then it got it got uh my buyers and my sellers into the legal legal mess legal house so this one is from the house to the sewer to the street to the street that's it yeah and yes. what they do is they check to make sure that there's no blockages there and they check to make sure that there's no cracks in the pipes and if there are or if it's something that you can just flush out you know, I had one where all they had to do was pay, the inspection was like 300, but to flush it out, it was like 900 bucks. So, okay, that's new for me. That one is new for me. So, yeah. what's up with the, with the uh, sewer inspection? How much is that report? It's about $300. $300. $300, yeah. That's Depending separate on from a home inspection, but this is separate. separate. Yeah, home inspection. You gotta get it some guy, like, the special inspection. Absolutely. That's the only one for me. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, it, it's, not, it's not something you have to do. You don't have okay. to do it, no. but I recommend that you do it. I recommend that you just get them all out of the way. Nobody wants to get that phone call two years later, or a year later, or a month later. Hey, we just found out there's a huge crack in the sewer connection. It's gonna cost us about ten thousand dollars to fix. Well, I should tell them, make the buyers aware that they wanna do it. Yeah, it's up to them. It's up to them. It's entirely just up to them. Now, just make them. sure, make sure though that later on, when you're filling out your AVID, when you're Before filling out your TBS, you're putting selling agent recommended sewer inspection, buyer chose not to. Yeah. And then they mm -hmm. sign and you sign that's and you're okay. Perfect. Okay? But always recommend it. All right? Uh, so that's what that page covers. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this page talks about the days that we talked about. The seller has seven days to give us all those disclosures. Okay? We have to review them. Then it says within 17 days, we have to do uh, uh, all of our inspections. We have to complete our appraisal. We also have to complete our loan. Again, the contract I think says up to 21 days now, or it still says 17. 17. So we have 17 days to where we have to remove all of our contingencies. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, just keep in mind, we have a lot of work to do over the next two weeks. We have our inspections, we have our loan, we have our appraisal. We have all these things that we have to do, and this contract is going to repeatedly remind you, okay? You, you okay with that? Good, sign right here. I think it also talked about effect of cancellation. Okay, let's talk about that really, really quick. It's just, I wanna make sure everybody knows that. Okay, effect of cancellation. Because that's important. And then we're almost there. Effect, okay, right here. Effect of buyer's removals of contingencies. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I need you to know that once you remove your contingencies, your deposit is going to be very difficult, almost impossible to get back in there, okay? The contract states that once you, in writing, stipulate to the seller, I have removed my inspection contingency, I have removed my appraisal contingency, I have removed my loan contingency. Once you do that in writing, you have then put the seller on notice that now you, seller, have to perform. And if the seller doesn't perform, that means that you can sue them for performances and for performance and for damages, right? 
But by doing that, that also means that you're not going to get your deposit back. And if you try to cancel now, it's on you. Are you okay with it? It's from both sides. It's from both, both sides. sides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just keep that in mind, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. All right. Next slide. Uh, brokers, representative capacity. Representative capacity really only has to do when you have someone that's representing, uh, you know, an, an, an organization that the, the sign that we talked about earlier, trusts, probate. It could also reference though power of attorney, somebody who's been incapacitated. There's a lot of different reasons, but that just means that you have the rep, the authoritative capacity to sign for another entity. Okay. Um, right here, arbitration and mediation. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Byer, all this basically says is that if we have breach of contract, you're not going to go sue them immediately. You're going to try to resolve it through arbitration and mediation. I need you to sign right here. Okay, a lot of legal definitions. This just repeats what we talked about earlier. There's definitions on the contract. I need you to sign right there. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, seller will sign up here if they accept, and if they counter, that's gonna be checked off and they're gonna give us a counter. Okay? Now here's what is typically going to happen. You're probably going to have to explain this to them once. Once. Then, after you start submitting multiple offers, truth is, hey, just start signing. <laughs> And when they're doing DocuSign, it's even quicker. Like I'll send it to a buyer and they'll send it within 30 seconds. Oh, it's completed. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you will probably have to explain this to your client once. Then when they feel more comfortable and confident that you can help them you know, through this process, then it becomes, it becomes you know, significantly much easier. Okay, so that's the purchase agreement. Now, let's talk real quick. Oh, the buyer's inspection advisory. And all this form basically says is that Buyer, you are strongly encouraged to complete all of your home inspections, including the ones that I recommended earlier. The buyer's home inspection, the roof inspection, the sewer inspection, the chimney inspection if necessary. So this form is basically putting the buyer on notice that, hey, we highly recommend that you complete all of these inspections uh, during the process, okay? Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, please approve. The next form is the Transaction Coordinator Fee Disclosure, also known as the TCP Disclosure. This is not uncommon to the industry. Many firms have a transaction coordinating fee. We have one as well and we have a disclosure. It's very important that you bring this up early during the process so that the buyer isn't surprised by it when they see that fee showing up on their estimated HUD or on their settlement statement. So um, I suggest that you, you Again, at the beginning of the process, you bring it to their attention, you advise them that it is a fee that will show up during the escrow transaction. No money is ever for, uh, collected up front. It's only paid for uh, through, uh, through escrow. The last disclosure that we use, uh, and I suggest that you, again, get this approved early in the transaction during the initial buyer consultation meeting is the affiliated business disclosure. Again, not uncommon to the industry. Our firm is not the only firm that utilizes one of these forms. All this does is it just lists all the companies that exist under the umbrella that we operate business in and which companies we are affiliated with. All right, let's deal with the objections, right? Some of the objections that you're gonna be dealing with are, number one, can you give me some of the commissions back, okay? There is a very large, very successful real estate firm, starts with the letter R, ends with IN, FIN, and they are known for giving their commissions back to the, uh, to the buyers. So you're gonna get that question, can you give me some of the commissions back? Right? You need to be prepared for how to handle that objection. And really, truthfully, if somebody says to me, uh, hey Paul, I'd like for you to give me some of your commission back uh, if I use you as my agent. My response is, so Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Seller, what you're saying then is, is you'd like for me to give back some of the commission that I've earned to you at the close of escrow, is that correct? Okay. And tell me, uh, you didn't pay any commissions, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, buyer. It's the seller that paid our commission. So help me understand why you'd like for some of me to, for me to give me give you some of that commission back. And most of the time, they're not going to really have a good response for that, um, other than well, there's other companies that do that as well. I see. So, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, what you're telling me then is because there are other firms that give their commissions back, you'd like to see, you'd like for me to do that as well. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. or Mrs. Buyer. Are there other people that do your job? Well, yes, of course there are other people that do my job. 
call Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if there are other people that do your job, would you be willing to give up some of your salary or some of your wages that you earn for doing your work to your company just because there's other people that are doing the same job you do? Would that be something that you'd be comfortable with? No. So then Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, help me understand why you'd ask me to do that. Right? So I, I want you to be prepared for that type of a question. That's probably how I would handle it, the most tactful way to handle it. Um, when you put, uh, you, you reverse the table, uh, you'll understand that. More importantly, as a buyer's agent, you know, especially in the seller's market, you work extra hard to get that offer accepted. And many times you're gonna go above and beyond your, the call of duty in order to get those offers accepted. So it's really important that you build value for what it is that you're gonna do. And you build value by, um, by covering those expectations that you're going to be expecting from the buyers that is done during the initial buyer's consult, right? Why don't I just go directly to the listing agent? That's another objection that you're going to hear. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, what you're telling me then is, is you think that you'd be uh, better off going directly to the listing agent. Is that correct? Well, yes. Okay, I see. And Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, help me understand who is the listing agent representing the seller. Absolutely, they are representing the seller. And tell me, who do they have a fiduciary responsibility towards the seller? The seller. And it's their job to help the seller get the highest or the lowest price. The highest price, of course. And so, what we have here is a case where we have the listing agent working for the seller, having a fiduciary responsibility, and getting them the highest price. Is that correct? Yes. And that's the person that you want representing you? Question mark. I think it's better off that you have me representing you and fighting for you and, and making sure that I fulfill my fiduciary responsibility for you so that I can also get you the best price and negotiate the best for you. Isn't that right? Yes. Great. Let's get the paperwork out of the way and, fill, and get that off the field. Right? Okay. Uh, I don't want to offer more, okay? especially in the seller's market. You know, you're going to have to learn how to deal with this objection, right? And the truth is, when you're working with a buyer that says, I don't want to offer more, uh, what that tells me is that I didn't do a good enough job laying the foundation for what my expectations were going to be. In other words, I did not, during that buyer's consult, explain to them that, hey, it's a seller's market, there's going to be a, a strong possibility that we're going to have to offer the over the list price. There, and there's a couple different scenarios here as to why that could happen. Number one, the seller may have priced it low on purpose to aggressively uh, get competition, or they're under a time constraint, and so that's what's causing that uh, that frenzy. Or it's just it's just such a hot property that there's going to be multiple offers on it anyway. Okay, so I don't want to offer more. I see. So, Mr. Buyer or Mrs. Seller, what you're telling me then is is that you don't want to offer more for this home. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, do you really want this home? Yes, I see. And Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you did say that you wanted this home for your family and for your children, if, if it applies. Is that correct? Yes. And Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if we were to increase the, 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 the price or offer price of this home by, say, an extra $20,000, if that had an impact of about $65 to $70 per month, is that something that you think you could swing, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? They're probably going to say yes. And Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, if what we did was cut down some of the Starbucks or cut down eating out a little bit every month, just a little bit, right? Instead of having that extra cup of coffee every day at Starbucks, we did it at home. And it made it possible that you could afford that home by increasing the price for an extra $30,000. Would it be worth it? Yes or no, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? It would be, wouldn't it? Yes. So you just have to frame it correctly, right? And make sure that they understand why they need to offer more for the home that they said they wanted initially for themselves and for their family. All right, so I hope this training is valuable. I hope it, it, it not only covered just briefly how to fill out the RPA, but more importantly, how to do it and, and in a way that you have set your expectations for your buyers. You set their expectations for what they can expect from you. And you also know now what to do to go out there and get those offers accepted, right? All right, good luck, you guys. I appreciate it.